Okay, uh, I believe it was sometime in the early 90s and close to the time we were about to get exemption. Annie Broker, uh, who made name Annie Tidman, but she had been married to Pat Broker. She was the loyal officer two. Pat Broker was loyal officer one, as appointed by L. Ron Hubbard in the last days of his life, were appointed to those positions which were higher than David Miscavige, who was not included in any parting words of Hubbard in terms of continuing church leadership. Uh, she was very important, obviously, because we had worked for three years intensively to depower her husband, Pat, which ultimately left, uh, resulted in him leaving the church and going off quietly. And so everything had been hunky-dory. She, she had gotten remarried, and she was now Annie Logan. Uh, I just call her Annie Broker because that's what people knew her as. Um, her, hus her new husband, Jim Logan, had gotten into a tiff where he had criticized Miscavige, became persona non grata. He was a very prideful guy. He wouldn't back down. He had blown or left and been declared earlier, a little bit earlier. Annie and he were very deeply in love. Annie decided apparently one day she was going to go get reunited with Jim Logan. He was up in Nova Scotia where his parents were. One morning I got up, I got the alert, Annie Broker's gone. Okay, well, this is, you know, a five-alarm fire because this is, you know, I spent four years working directly for Miscavige on depowering the brokers. And now Pat Broker, you know, we'd even talked about it overtly, Pat Broker, our biggest uh, gun we got against Pat Broker is Annie Broker. So if he ever tries to do something publicly, we got his wife we can use against him. Like you, I guess you guys have seen that, how ex-wives can be used against somebody. That's what the thought was. So when she blew, I knew this was a crying catastrophe. And again, I believe it, I knew it was in the morning because I had been exercising. I had my sweats on, my sneakers on, and a t-shirt. And I think I was either, I don't know where on the property I was, but I had to rush to my office, get the brief from security. I don't remember all the details, except that they knew uh, she was getting on a flight for Boston. Uh, to Nova Scotia via Boston at a LAX at a certain time. I literally just grabbed the wallet, a cell phone, threw my pockets, jumped in the car and, start, and told my communicator, which was my secretary, get me on the soonest flight to Boston, whether it be Ontario, which is halfway to LA, or LA, and just started heading down the road 90, 100 miles an hour um, towards Ontario. And on the way, you know, because if they didn't have one in Ontario, I could I could go straight on to LAX. Ontario, California. Ontario, California. Um, it so happened that they had a flight. The next one was out of Ontario, so I jumped onto a flight in Ontario, and it was supposed to arrive like uh, 20 minutes after hers, or you know, a short time after her flight. There were going to be some of the latest flights coming into Boston Logan Airport, um, so. You know, we didn't have ground-to-air communication, so for the next flight across the country, I had no idea what was happening. I got there, got on the cell phone, found out what gate she was supposed to take. She'd already arrived, found out what gate she was supposed to take off to to Nova Scotia, and literally sprinted in that direction, went all the way out towards the, the end terminal, got to the end, and it was one of the smaller planes, you know, the double prop jobs, and the people were being loaded from a from a a counter area that I couldn't get access to. And so I literally went down a set of stairs and, and ho hoping that I was looking at the right airplane. And I was lo looking at a door that was that had a, a, a barricade ribbon across it. Um, I saw a group of passengers be walking by about 20 feet away towards a, a plane that was warming up. And I saw Annie. And I just said, Annie! And she swung around and literally when she saw me, she kind of was startled and then her shoulders just drooped. I mean, she just was defeated. I mean, she, I didn't even have an argument with her. I didn't have to get a persuasion. She just she was so shocked, I guess, that she had gotten so close, you know, to reuniting with Jim and it, that it was impossible that I could have got there, I guess, in retrospect and having talked to her, that, that was what was going through her mind that she was just defeated and she, I said, we got to talk. And then she literally just drooped her shoulders, walked over, and then we went into the terminal. She missed the plane. We talked for a couple hours. Um, 
I got her agreement that we should go back, um, that her that her lack of presence might might uh, I, you know I told her that her lack of presence uh, might somehow affect the exemption that we were working so hard to get. I really played on her loyalty to L. Ron Hubbard because you know quite frankly in the analysis. Um, she was extremely loyal to the guy. I mean, she lived with him for the last six years of his life in, in tough conditions. Um, you know, I got her agreement to come back. Um, I called Miss Gavage, told him that all the Logan was shutting down. There was no more flights out. I was having my communicator arrange for us to get hotel rooms. And we'd leave first thing in the morning. He said, no, forget it. He says, I got, I got JT's jet coming up there, John Travolta's jet. He said, it's going to arrive at such and so time. It's out at the private terminal. You get on that and you get her back. I mean, he did not want to risk Annie making a call to Jim in some hotel room or having a change of heart. You know, obviously, we're going to have to have separate hotel rooms. And it was that urgent to him that he independently had arranged to get this private jet to, to meet us and come specially to Boston and get us back. And we, we flew, you know, through the night. Uh, on that jet, just Annie and I, and talked all the way back, and went all the way back to, and I guess we got back home at like, I don't know, some crazy hour.